blessed to be here and so excited to see how God is just using this church. I mean, the Spirit of God is so rich and real, and thank you for leading us into his presence, and it was just wonderful. Um, Pastor Travis and Pamela were so blessed to be here, and thanks, Pastor Donna, wherever she may be, <laughs> for inviting us to come for the ladies' event, too, for tonight. Don't you dare miss it. You'll miss half your life if you miss the women's conference tonight. So you gotta, you got to bring people with you. But, um, but we um, have just loved getting to know them this morning, and, uh, you know, it's just great to be here and see what God's doing in this wonderful church. And bless you, sister. I mean, what a powerful testimony that God has given you. And um, I'm going to continue on in that flow of never give up this morning. Uh, but let me just tell you about some things. I, I was a missionary in India before I met and married Pastor Ron Cox of Kingwood Church. And... Um, so we still uh, support missions all over the world. So anything that comes to us goes right back out into missions, and we uh, we love that. We still support the younger girls in that we that have rescued from the brothels of India. Uh, also, a Paraguay missionary that feeds 200 street kids every single day. And um, Casa Hogar is a ministry in Honduras that we support. And also, uh, we put one, we have a, the oldest, uh, longest running master's commission in, uh, in America. And so, uh, we always sponsor one kid because we're all, we are all about bridging the generations. We take, we just stand in the middle and we take the generations and we bring them together. That's who we are, legacy of purpose, the bridging of the generations. And so we we put uh, one uh, kid through our master's commission program every year. So I said all that to say, we had conveniently have a table located outside and um, it's got uh, some things on there. There's Here's my testimony, which you will hear uh, tonight, I'm also going to weave some of my testimony in uh, today, but um, this is the testimony on DVD. We also have it on a CD. This is Never, Never, Never Give Up, which I'm going to do the four points, and we're going to blast through there this morning, and then we're going to see God do some amazing things and miracles this morning. And so, and then there's Please Take Your Seat. How many of you know we have been raised up, seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and God is not up in heaven wringing his hands over our situation. And he says, now I want you to walk in your God-given authority. So this is the uh, power of prayer and fasting. Please take your seat, the supply of the Spirit. And then Ron has one in here on the Lord's Prayer that is very rich and deep and good, good, good. So, um... Also, here's a book that's been written on the story of our life. Pastor Mark Sims, Ron's associate of 30 years, wrote a book on the story of our life, uh, his life, actually. I got to come in on the tail end of it. Huh? And so um, this is Call It Incredible. Uh, Ron pastored Kingwood Church for 35 years, took care of an invalid wife for 24 and a half of those years, raised two beautiful daughters, and... Um, you know, you're going to just hear our story. So the people that have done I Can Only Imagine and some of those faith-based movies have given us a contract to do a full-length movie on the story of our life. Ah! So, yeah. So um, you can get your signed copy today because, you know, when we get famous, <laughs> we won't be able to sign a million copies in books a million. Okay. So, Sister Pastor, I'd love to bless you with all these. Yay! Okay. <laughs> Oops, there we go. Okay, so I loved meeting, um, I think, four out of five of your children this morning. <laughs> and so we're just, um, we're, and, you're, and both moms, yeah. So we're just blessed to be here. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for this incredible church. And the unity that we sense here in this church. And God, we, we are, are careful to give you all the glory for what will be done all day today. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, today we're going to talk about never give up. <laughs> because how many of you know we are living in the last days. And the enemy, he, he wants us to give up. He wants us to throw in the towel. But we're not going to do that, right? 
right. And so Jesus told us in John 16, 33, um, in the Amplified Bible, he says, I have, he was telling his disciples as they were walking and talking, he said, um, you know, I'm about to go away. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to die and I'm going to leave you, but I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and he is the comforter. But he said, and they're like, what? And so, um, yeah, he said, they were thinking, I thought you came to be the king. And so <laughs> little did they know he was the king of kings. But he, he told me, he said, I told you all these things so that in me you will have perfect peace. How many of you need perfect peace? I know I do. I want perfect peace. And so he said, because in this world, you could possibly have some trials and some bumps in the road. <laughs> no, he didn't. He said, in this life, in this world, you will have tribulation. You will have. And so I looked it up in the Strong's Concordance, Webster's Dictionary. Tribulation. Are you ready for this? Because this is what Jesus told us we could expect in these last days. He said, in this life you will have tribulation, which is grief, sorrow, pain, affliction, burdens, worry, misery, sadness, heartache. Aren't you glad you came? <laughs> heartache. And last but not least, plain old trouble. In this, you can expect to have plain old trouble in this life. And you know what? Jesus, well, you're thinking, well, he was such a naysayer. I thought he was like Mr. Positive. No, you know what? He was telling us that so that we would get prepared for the storm that is coming. We're living in the last days, and God is trying to tell us you need to have something on the inside of you that is stronger than the storm that's coming. You've got to have God on the inside of you at all times because let me just tell you, what's down in the well comes up in the bucket, <laughs> right? And you better have the Word of God deep on the inside of you because that's what's going to come out. When you get squeezed, you better, it better be the Word that's coming out of you. And so because, you know, we understand that people's lives are in trouble. People's marriages are in trouble. Their kids are in trouble. Their finances, their marriages are in trouble. Our nation is in trouble. And so we have got to understand that we've experienced a great immoral and spiritual and ethical decline over the past few decades in our, in our country and in our culture, but it has seeped into the Christian community. And so we travel the country. We see that people... Pastors, Christians are ready to give up and throw in the towel. But we can't do that. We can't do that. They're saying, or is this really even worth it? Listen, I'm a Rama girl. I went to Rama Bible Training Center. I am a faith teacher. And I do believe that God wants us to be blessed and prosperous. But he also said, in this life, you will face tribulation. You're going to face adversity in our life. And the enemy will try to hinder your walk with God. And he will try to put roadblocks in your path. And every, every time you turn around, the enemy is going to be there wanting to stop you from doing what God has called you to do. And so we, have, we can't give up in these last days. And so um, I, I'm going to uh, share four things with you. I'll never give up. Number one, never give up on God. Never give up on God because Jesus went on to say, yes, you will face tribulation and difficult times and distress and sufferings, but be courageous, be undaunted, be confident, be filled with joy. In other words, cheer up because I have overcome the world and I have deprived it of its power to harm you. So Jesus said, yes, you're going to go through difficult times, but if you'll stick with me, I'm going to see you through. I'm going to be with you because he says, I'm sending the Holy Ghost who's just like me, and he's going to come alongside you because you are an overcomer. You are more than a conqueror. You're, you're more because the greater one lives on the inside of you. God is the greater one. He'll give you strength and purpose and vision and direction when you don't know what to do. He's there to give you answers. And he wants us to grow up and mature through the rough transitions and the trials of life. We must grow up spiritually so we can help others grow in the things of God and pull them out of darkness. Listen, I, I know that um, September has even been designated as Suicide Awareness Month. 
Because so many people are committing suicide, they are putting numbers up on your TV, and you're seeing commercials that if you were, we see that pastors, I mean, are, are, are committing suicide, they're hopeless right now. And I, I stood at the TV and I said, God, um, you know, we just had another suicide in our community, a teenage, and I said, don't they know that they are breaking their family's heart? Don't they see that the, the despair that comes to their family when that happens? And the Lord said, Suzanne, why don't you just go back 26 years ago and think about where you were? And I said, oh, God, at 31 years old. Listen, I went to my first drug treatment center when I was 13 years old. My parents divorced. We moved to Birmingham out of a small town in Alabama. And I became uh, very suicidal because you know what? Those voices are real. Those voices that tell you nobody loves you. Nobody cares about you. You might as well take your life because everybody will be better off. Listen, I, at 13 years old, by the time I was 16, I was a full-blown alcoholic. By the time I was 23, I was a cocaine addict. Almost all my teeth have had to be replaced because Satan takes you so much further than you ever wanted to go, and he keeps you longer than you ever wanted to stay. Listen, I never meant to become like that. I never I never set out to become like that, but, but I didn't have anybody speaking into my life saying, Suzanne, God has a plan for your life. And so for years, I had tried drug overdoses. I had tried running my car off a bridge. I had heard those voices say, just load that pistol. Just load it. And I got so drunk that when I woke up, I had a pistol laying in my lap. And I thought, oh, my Lord. And so I was coming home from work one day at 31 years old, 30 from the time I was 13 until the time I was 31. I had lived out in the world, and you can fill in the blanks on that. And I was going home from work one day, and I looked over, and there was this huge camp meeting sign out in front of this church that I passed every day for five years. Camp meeting sign. You know God's still into signs and wonders. <laughs> and so I went past there, and I thought, camp meeting? I wonder what that means. And I, I thought, must mean summer camp or something, because I didn't know any Pentecostal lingo at Nana's church. <laughs> and so we, um, so I drove home, and I, I went home, and I, and I, went to sleep, and when I woke up, I knew I had to be at that church. Well, I didn't want to go to church, you know, and so I, you know, never give up on God <laughs> because he never gives up on you. So I, so I got in my car, and I drove down there, and I sat in the parking lot, and I watched all these people coming in in suits and ties and dresses and Bibles, and I was in my skin-tight blue jeans and my low-cut blouse because I normally went out as a lady of the evening, and, and I was sitting in that parking lot, and I thought, you know, this is just another place that I don't belong. I could be in a room full of people, and I felt like I never fit in anywhere. And it was like a hand pushed me out of my car. And I walked up the steps to that church, and I didn't want to go to church on Tuesday night. Who goes to church on Tuesday night? <laughs> and there was a sweet little lady standing at the door. I'm telling you, greeters, like sister, sister pastor's mama, <laughs> greeters. <laughs> have kingdom assignments. And this little lady looked at me and she said, honey, are you by yourself? And I said, yes, ma'am. I said, I don't know the first thing about an Assembly of God church. I just know that when I woke up, I had to be here. And she went, praise the Lord. And I went, oh, no, I've heard about people like you. <laughs> I, think, I think we had an Avon lady like that one time. And so... She said, come on, you can come and sit with me. And so before I knew it, I was trapped in her web. And so I'm sitting with her, and all of a sudden, here comes the choir and the band, and they are jumping up and down, hooting, rooting, much like these up here. Yeah. And so I'm thinking, this cannot be church. I mean, drums and guitars in the church, that is like sacrilege. And so, you know, at Nana's church. And so, I, I, you know, here comes the pastor with probably one of the most eloquent speakers you'll ever hear in your life, and it was Dr. Mark Rutland. Well, he was a missionary at the time. He's gone on to be the president of Southeastern University and Oral Roberts University. And um, he came out and he shared a simple message on the love of God. And when he looked across the audience that night, he said, you may be here tonight, 
and you wish that you had never even been born. And I thought, that's me. Every day that I wake up and look in the mirror, I hate myself that much more. Every time I see a sunrise, I think, why am I even on this planet? I don't even know what I'm doing here. And he said, you may be here tonight and you wish you had never even been born. But I'm here to tell you, you can be born again. You can start your life over. It doesn't matter what you did last night. You can be washed clean by the blood of Jesus. And you can stand before a holy God as if you had never sinned. And I thought, I had tears streaming down my face. I thought, how have I been raised in church almost my whole life and I've never even heard this? And he said, if you want to pray a simple prayer like I prayed, and he was about to give the altar call, he said, bow your heads. And my legs jumped up. I ran to the front. I had never seen an altar call in my life. And I knelt down and I said, God, if this is real, I want it. I want to change. I want a new beginning. I said, God, I don't even have anything to offer you but a broken heart. And he said, Suzanne, that's all I want is your heart. And that night on September 14th, 1993, I became a new creation in Christ Jesus. Woo! Hallelujah. Never lose the wonder of your salvation. You have a story to tell. And God will put people in your path to hear your story. Listen, I found the answer. His name is Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you, never give up on God. Because he will never give up on you. I wasn't even looking for God. But he was looking for me. He'll speak peace to you when you need it. And when you're ready to give up, God will see you through. Listen, we are on assignment from Almighty God to bring hope to a lost and a broken world. Corey Ten Boom said, there is no pit so deep that God's love isn't deeper still. We can always fall into the loving arms of a faithful God. Listen, our, our world is being shaken. But I've discovered the greater the shaking, the greater the glory. The greater the shaking, the greater the glory. God will pour out his glory on those who are continually turned toward him. So never give up on God. Never buy into the lie that God hasn't been faithful to you. The enemy will try to tell you that. When we stood at the graveside of our beautiful 40-year-old daughter, youth pastors of our church. She could sing the roof off a building. Ron uh, I took care of an invalid wife with Huntington's Korea, one of the most hideous long-term illnesses known to the medical community. It's a, a very rare neurological disease. And then seven years ago, our beautiful Tiffany called us to their house with their three beautiful children and Jeremy, her husband, and said, Daddy, I have Huntington's disease. My Lord. What do you do when you get a report like that? Do you hang your harp on the willow tree? Just like the children of Israel when they went into Babylonian captivity. And the enemy said, let us hear you sing the song of the Lord now in a strange land. And they hung their harp on the willow tree, and they refused to sing the song of the Lord. Not my family. Our family still lifts our hands and praises God because we know that our God is faithful, I tell you. We're believing for a DNA change, and that thing will never touch my five grandchildren. We're standing in the battle. We're standing. This is how I fight my battles. We fight him with worship. We fight him with the word of God. In Jesus' name. So never give up on God. Say it with me. I will never give up on God. Number two, never give up on joy. Never give up on joy. Nehemiah 8.10 says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. We need a renewed hunger to receive the baptism and the Holy Ghost, right? And fire. <laughs> what happens when you get the baptism and the Holy Ghost? You don't get more of the Spirit. You get all of Him when, when you get born again. You, you don't get more of the Spirit. He gets more of you. Well... Okay, so the baptism in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues is not just a denominational distinctive. It's not a unique worship style. It's an infusion of God's power for breakthrough. 
It's an infusion of God's power for life change and kingdom advance. The baptism in the Holy Ghost doesn't make you ready for heaven. Honey, it makes you ready for Walmart. <laughs> right? <laughs> We need a renewed baptism of love. That's what the Holy Ghost does for you. My lands. And so, you know, we just, we, we've got to just keep going. Listen, and you don't have to tarry for years and years. I was three days old in the Lord. I got saved on a Tuesday night. We went Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night. It's camp meeting. That's what you do. You go every night. And so here I was, you know, brand new Christian, had no idea what was going on. I just knew I wanted to keep going back and keep going back every time the door was open. And so, you know, so I went on Friday night with some of my friends, and there they, you know, there's the evangelist, fiery evangelist. And when he got done preaching, he said, if you want everything God's got for you, I want you to come to the front. Well, I had no idea what I was in for. <laughs> so... I went to the front with the whole tribe of Israel. I mean, we were packed in like sardines. And here, here he comes. And I'm thinking, he is pushing those little ladies down in the floor. Like, <laughs> what is going on? I had never seen anything like all this. And so, you know, he gets in front of me. And I was like four rows deep in people. And I had my hand up like this because, I mean, the fire of God was coming off the man. I didn't know anything about the anointing. I just wanted to touch the fire. And so he got in front of me, and our eyes locked, and he saw the hunger in my eyes. And he looked at my friend Karen, just standing behind me, and he said, get behind her and push. And I mean, she pushed me up to where my fingertips touched his, and it was like 10,000 volts of electricity started going down my arm. I looked at Karen with my eyes this big, and she said, go with it. <laughs> I don't know. And so I did. I hit the floor like a rock as God washed years of depression off of me, filled me with joy unspeakable and full of glory. I mean, when I sat up, my throat was on fire, and I was speaking in a language I had never heard before. <laughs> does God have a sense of humor or what? Yes, he does. I was the first person I ever heard speak in tongues. <laughs> yeah. So never give up on joy. Joy is not a feeling. It is a fruit, right? It's not by chance. It is by choice. And so we have to, you know, the enemy is never going to give up. He'll roll up in your driveway just like he did every Friday night. And, you know, I was, um, you know, I was still trying to, trying to work out this whole salvation with fear and trembling, <laughs> you know. And so I, I thought, oh, gosh, there were times where I w would get home uh, from work or when I was at work. There were times when I would have a bad day. I was still dealing with a whole lot of anger issues. And the only way I had ever used to deal with anger was just stuff the monster. Drugs, alcohol, men, power, you know. And so it was like, what to do? And so I didn't know. I was, you know, my new friends were now 80 years old, <laughs> you know. <laughs> my, my, my little friend, Miss Betty, my little pioneers of faith. So I was still working with some of these people, you know, that I used to drink and drug with. And they would say, oh, please, just come on out with us and have a drink. You're, you've had a bad day. You know, you're not going to live like this forever. Little Pollyanna, purebred. You know, you're not going to be a church lady forever. And, uh, and they would say, come on, just go on out with us. And I had a choice to make. I'd say, I'll be right back. And I would go get on that nasty bathroom floor in that printing company. And I would kneel down and say, God, you know that I want to go. And I know that I want to go. But I don't want to lose this peace that I have with you. I don't want to lose this joy that I have on the inside of me. Please, God, will you just help me? Help me say no to them so that I can continue to say yes to you. And, I mean, I would pray in the Holy Ghost for a few minutes, and I would get up, and it was like I would open that door like super Christian. And I would say, you go that way. I'm going this way. I'm going to Miss Betty's house. I know Miss Betty. She's got a cake. She's got the word of God. She's got the Holy Ghost and fire. I said, come on now. I, I'm going to go to Miss Betty's house. Miss Betty taught me that the word of God generates life. And
and it creates faith, and it heals hurts, and it builds character, and it scares the daylights out of the devil. Jesus taught us how to fight the devil with it is written. My little Miss Betty, I'm telling you, she taught me how to tithe and give to missions. She taught me how to plead the blood of Jesus. She taught me how to pray through until you get the victory. You're going to hear more about that tonight. Mm. And so, um, so listen, you know, regardless of how spiritual you are, no matter how long you've walked with God, you are going to face trials and tribulations and distress and frustrations and traumatic tragedies, disappointments and delays. And people are going to hurt you, they're going to break your heart, and you're going to get offended. But we cannot, we have to choose joy. We must choose the peace of God. We must choose to walk in love. We, if you haven't read The Bait of Satan lately, then you need to get John Bevere's book out, and you need to read, I read that book every year. Every year. It's important to keep feeling yourself up so because the enemy never gives up lets up shuts up so you know you better have something on the inside of you that's going to combat that and so um you know I just thank the Lord for people who pour into our lives you know and so my little pioneers of faith taught me that the kingdom of God is righteousness peace and joy in the Holy Ghost Joy in the Holy Ghost. You can, you can ask the Alabama district ministers, who is the minister in the Alabama district that has been through the most tragedies, bar none? They'll say, Pastor Ron Cox. I don't know how he made it. I don't know how he made it through everything he made it through. Definitely. And then they'll say, who is the pastor in Alabama that is the craziest, wildest, funnest, joyful Christian pastor in the whole state of Alabama? And they'll say, bar none, it is Ron Cox. <laughs> you remember when Thomas Trask was our superintendent? We, we were a general counsel. And somebody came out and said, oh, my gosh, Pastor Ron's in the bathroom, got Thomas Trask, the superintendent of the United States of America, in a headlock in the bathroom. <laughs> I was like, oh, my lands, he's crazy. He goes, because Brother Trask would always kiss you right here on the forehead. And Ron was like, ew. So anyway, so <laughs> he would do it. He would do that. He was so precious. So, <laughs> so he got him in a headlock. He beat him to the punch. Yeah. So, um, so say, say it with me. I will never give up on God. I will never give up on joy. Number three, never give up on your miracle. Woo! Never give up on your miracle. Psalm 77, 14 says, you are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the people. Listen, God is still in the miracle business. He is. He, many churches have disregarded or at best ignored the miraculous. But I declare to you, we serve the God of miracles. He is the God of miracles. He's a supernatural God. We are a Pentecostal people, and I appreciate pastors who let the gifts of the Spirit flow in their altars. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, we, God goes beyond what we can see or feel or explain. He is the God whoops, of breakthrough. And so don't lower your expectations to protect your disappointments. Don't lower your expectations. To protect your disappointments. You say, but I've been to the altar. I've tried to get free. But what if, what if God doesn't come through for me? What if he does? What if he does come through? What if today is your day for your miracle? What if your day is the day for your breakthrough? What if today is the day? And we declare that it is because miracles, God is still the God of miracles. We're not here to seek the miracle. We're here to seek the miracle worker. And he is always ready. He stands ready. God is alive and compassionate and merciful. He cares about your pain. Miracles happen when we come to the end of ourselves. <laughs> Woo! Miracles happen.
happen when we come expecting them to happen. I know. I sense the expectation in the room. Listen, I just believe, you know, like Oral Roberts used to say, something good is going to happen to you today. <laughs> Expect your miracle. My heart's desire is to show this loving God to a world who has given up and is ready to throw in the towel. They struggle in their bondage. But you know what? Whom the sun sets free, woo, is free indeed. Amen? Jesus' ministry was filled with miracles. And when we see Jesus doing miracles, we see the heart of the Father. God will heal a crooked leg to get to a crooked heart. God will heal a blind eye to reach a blind soul. God will raise a dead boy to raise a dead life. He is the God of miracles, and he never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Creative miracles happened when I was in India, and I got to witness those. Listen, you can get the book, okay? And so... We are a generation hungry for God, and they don't even realize what they're looking for. They don't, but they're hungry for God. He is the God of miracles. When I was in India, listen, I was, <laughs> I was, oh my, broke my ankle, and God healed my ankle. My toes had turned black. My, um, I thought I was going to have to go. They called me, they started calling me Calamity Jane. <laughs> it's because, you know, all kinds of crazy things happened to me when I was in India. Because <laughs> the devil hates missionaries. And I'm telling you, he hates preachers and pastors and he hates Christians in general. You have a target on your back. You might as well just know that. Right? So I broke my ankle. I, my pastor broke his ankle at the same time, and um, I, I was like, oh, I had this giant cast on my foot, which if you've never been to a hospital in India, then um, you just haven't experienced life. And so, <laughs> so without an aspirin or a shot or anything, they just took my ankle and went <laughs> and snapped it back in place and put a cast on it. And so a few days later, I was like, Oh, my word, my toes are black. I think I'm going to have to go back to America and have a surgeon look at my foot. And so, um, meanwhile, we had a lady named Mina in our, in, and I'm going to get to her in just a minute. And so, um, we had a, and so I, she was in a wheelchair. I would take her down. I would limp down there. Here I was. My pastor was in a cast. I was in a cast. And so, we were, <laughs> and so, should I tell this part? Yeah. Okay, so Pastor Ivan, we were not a party when we came to church. I had 15 demon-possessed girls who had been rescued from the brothels of India. You start singing songs about the blood and things happen. And so we were not a party when we came to church. And so my pastor was not so excited about us coming. I, was, I worked with the first Project Rescue Home with David and Beth Grant. And so, um, and so when... He would see us coming. He would just like, ooh, because in India, there's a stigma with women and girls, and it kind of filters over into the church and the caste system and all that. And so uh, somebody had mailed me the book by Tommy Tenney, The God Chasers. It was, you know, that far back in time. And so um, so I read the book, and I was like, oh, I was getting in the van with my girls, and I had my cast on, and the Lord said, I want you to go back and get that book and give it to Pastor Ivan. And I said, oh, but it's so far. <laughs> it's so far, and I'm, you know, we're trying to get ready and getting the, he says, go back and get it. So I went, and I, I took the book, and I, um, there I was. Uh, I, I told Pastor Ivan, I said, when we were leaving, I said, I felt like the Lord wanted me to give you this book on the way out the door. And he goes, thank you, sister. Puts it under his arm, and the next Sunday morning, when we came in, I was in a cast, Mina was in a wheelchair, and I rolled her down there, and the whole presence of God had filled the house. And he said, I must announce to the church, I must ask Sister Suzanne to forgive me for the way that things have gone with the church and the girls and her ministry. And he said, God has changed my life through this book. 
And he said, sister, not only am I going to pray for me now, I want to pray for you. Because my toes, I was getting ready to go back. And he said, fire. And I mean, from the top of my head to the soles of my feet, I felt the fire of God. By the time I got back to my seat, my toes were pink. I went and had that cast cut off. I went to the Bangalore Missions Conference wearing my cute little high heel shoes. And so, you know what? God is still the God of miracles. <laughs> Mina, I'm going to go ahead and tell the story. I know. And then, I'll, and then we'll wrap it up. We only got one more point. Okay. So, Mina... God is still the God of miracles. They called us and said, Mina is a 40-year-old woman. She's in a government hospital. She has been here for three years. She hasn't walked in three years. Her girls are in an orphanage. Her husband has left her. And she's basically about to die, and we need this bed. Well, if you've ever been to um, Calcutta or places like that, you step over dead bodies. When they're about to die, they need the bed. So they'll just put them on the street and leave them there to die. So I went, I, I told Usha, I said, they want us to come and get this lady. We've got girls. We've got so much pain and uh, things going on in our house. I just don't know how we can take care of her because she, her, she had bone tuberculosis. Her spine had been completely eaten away with tuberculosis. There's no cure. And so uh, I, I said, what are we going to do? And Sister Usha said, we're going to go get her. <laughs> and I said, oh, my goodness. And so I said, okay, let's go. So we got in the van. It was 120 degrees. We didn't have air conditioning. Everybody stinks in India. So I said, okay. So we went and we got, we went into the government hospital, and I had never seen anything like it. And we, we got Mina. They put her in it. She maybe weighed 70 pounds maybe. And they, she was all bent over like this. She had big knobby knees where she had walked on her knees and um, just in excruciating pain every single day. So we picked her up, and we put her in the van. Her head was in my lap, and she's covered in lice. They had not bathed her in months, and she smelled so bad, and it was so hot. And I looked down at her, and I said, God, we are in way over our head. How are we even going to take care of her? I don't even know. And, and the Lord said, I want you to look at her. And I said, I am. I'm looking. I was looking at a hopeless situation. And he said, no, I want you to look at her. Like, look at her with the eyes of faith. Look at her like I am a miracle worker. Just look at her. And I looked at her, and I was overwhelmed with compassion. And I said, God, I am believing for her miracle. I do. I just feel like faith was dropped in my heart. And so every morning we would get her up and get my girls up, and we would. I taught a devotion every morning. And we would sing and worship, and and uh, one morning she said, "I want to, I want, I'm ready to receive Jesus." And I said, "Okay, so this means no more 300 million gods, only one true living God. You forsake all the other ones, and He becomes it." And she said, "That's right." And I said, "Okay." So she was, she prayed the sinner's prayer, and then there she was. She was born again. And I said, now it is your blood-bought covenant right to receive your miracle. She said, okay. So every Tuesday morning, I would preach on healing. We would go to church on Sundays. We would come back, have devotions every morning. On Tuesday mornings, I would teach healing. One morning, she raised her hand. She said, sister, today is my day. And I said, it's your birthday? She said, oh, no. <laughs> it's my day for my miracle. And I said, okay. I said, Mina, we're going to pull you out in the middle of the floor. And I, she was bent over like this in so much pain. And I said, me and the girls, we're going to lay hands on you, and we're going to pray for you, and then we're going to back off because I need you to know that it is not us. It is not us. We do not have, we couldn't heal a flea. Only Jesus Christ can heal you, and he loves you so much. He's going to do it. And she said, I know. And I said, okay. So the girls, you know, we're all like, no. Oh. And so today's the day. And so we pulled her out, and we start praying, and I just laid hands on her and said, Mina, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, receive your miracle. And then we backed off, and we just began to worship God. Oh, God, you are Jehovah Rapha. You are the Lord who heals. We sing praises to you. And all of a sudden, 
We begin to hear bones crack and pop and snap as God put a new spine in her. I'm telling you, she straightened up and lifted her hands. And I mean, we had Holy Ghost Church when we went to church on Sunday morning. Mina became the director of the orphanage <laughs> where her daughters were. And she says, I tell everybody about Jesus who comes in this place. I'm telling you, God is the God of miracles. He's still the God of miracles. Say it with me. I will never give up on God. I will never give up on joy. I will never give up on my miracle and I will never give up on my dream listen he's the Ephesians 320 God he will do exceeding abundantly above anything that you ask or hope or dream or imagine that is our God listen if I've learned anything from Ron Cox it's to never give up because without a vision the word says my people perish or they die. Listen, your pastor has a vision to reach a city. Don't give up on that dream. You hook up with it. If you're not the visionary, which I am not, I hooked up with a dream when I heard David Grant say, one million daughters of India at the marriage supper of the Lamb. He said, that is my dream. And I said, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of that dream. Listen, I'm telling you, God is the dream maker, and he will help you see it through. Listen, a dream will raise you out of yourself into another self that is greater than yourself. You'll never know the potential that lies within you until you attach yourself to a God dream. And to a God dream. Listen, you have been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. It's time to take our cities for God. It's time to not give up on your dream. Maybe you're believing God for your prodigal to come home. Maybe you're believing for your parents to get saved. Listen, my mom was 71 years old when she got born again. And she has a new heart. God put a new heart. I mean, like a new, like for real, she had a massive heart attack. And God put a new heart in her like a 16-year-old. And she's 96, and I still talk to her every single day of my life. He's still the God who fulfills dreams. Maybe your marriage needs to be healed. Maybe you're believing God, you know, that that. God's put a dream in your heart to, to write worship songs or to be a part of a ministry or to raise up a ministry. I'm telling you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with this video, Never Give Up on Your Dream. Derek Redmond was, was um, favored to win the 1992 Barcelona Olympics. And he's almost to the finish line. And he pulled his hamstring. You're going to see him fall back on the track. And now he's got to decide. He knows he's not going to win, but is he going to finish? Is he going to finish? Listen, I, am a, I run marathons, and I know I don't look like I probably do, but I do. And the first step is always the hardest, and the last mile is always the longest. But I'm telling you, you're going to see a man come out of the stands. It's his father. Because love cannot stand distance. And a heavenly father stands ready to meet you here at this altar today. I want you to hear. God is not, we're not going home to heaven limping, bleeding, and half dead. We're going home. The flag of heaven is not going to be half mask. It's going to be unfurled. He's not going to blow tap. He's not going to blow taps on the trumpet. It's going to be the sound of revelry. God's church is going home in a blaze of glory. I just re I just read the other the, the, in the in the last days. He said, "My glory is going to cover the earth as the waters cover." the sea or as the waters cover the earth. I said, "What, Lord, what does that mean? Your glory is going to, as the waters, the only time I remember when waters covered the earth was in Noah's day, the flood. He said, that's what I mean. The move of God that's going to happen is going to come from two different sources as it did in Noah's day. First of all, the heavens cracked open. 
and waters came down. Then the earth cracked open and waters went up. Waters coming down meant waters going up. And it was enough volume of water to cover the whole earth. He said, my glory is going to come. He said, my sovereignty is going to crack open the heavens. But he said, all I'm waiting for is the earth of you to crack open. Out of your inner being shall flow rivers of living water. I know that you're going to feel it's inadequate to meet the darkness that we confront. He said, but it's not inadequate when both waters get together. When you crack open, when you crack open, then I'm going to crack the heavens open. You're not going to build this church by yourself. This church, Pastor, I heard your hunger for God. You and your little wife, I, I, I see you. I see your hunger. You're God's little girl is who you are. I want you to listen to me. God's going to use this church as a city of refuge. Keep your doors open. Live by that word unity. You know the valley of dry bones. Let me tell you something about the valley of dry bones. The prophet was not free to prophesy to those dry bones until the dry bones decided to come together. I don't know what happened, but they just started rattling and coming together. But they didn't stand up like, and when he saw unity, he prophesied, come from the four winds. And they stood up, a mighty army for last day warfare. Are you all understanding that? God is in this place. Some of you are going to respond differently than others. You're not cookie cutters. We're not trying to make you conform to how anybody else responds. Respond how God tells you to respond. But let me tell you this, and we're going to give a call. I want you to listen. Every one of us are just alike in this building. I'm going to tell you the three areas that we're just alike. Every person here, every person, from the pastors to me to my wife, every person here has a need. Right? This one's harder to admit, but I'm telling you, I've pastored long enough to... Every person here has a hidden pain. Every per I'm not talking about necessarily sin. It could be sin. But everybody has a hidden pain. Whether you're producing it, some child or somebody else or whatever, a life. So everybody here has a need. And everybody here has a hidden pain. But thirdly, every person here has a potential in God that you haven't even come close to meeting yet. This altar call is only for those of you that will be honest enough to say, I have those three things in my life. Suzanne, you touched the, you touched what, not for Hot Springs, Arkansas, not very far from here, our first general council. Arkansas has a history of Pentecostal power. What if in Magnolia, God this morning cracked you open? And when God saw you crack open, He said, You need something else. I'm going to send waters down as you send waters up. Right now, we're going to ask if you're here without Jesus, you cannot sit back. If you're here and it's been a long time, you got church down. I worry sometimes about church people. We can do church with our eyes closed. We know how to do it. We're getting better at it all the time. 
But this is the time for an encounter with Jesus. You're here. I'm going to tell you something, and I've said this in the past, and I, I feel like shouting this again, honey. Listen to me. The prodigal is coming home. The prodigal is coming home. Keep the robe in your hand. A party's going to take. The first wave of evangelism is going to happen with moms and dads who've been believing God for their children. And then he's going to, they're going to come and they're going to realize that that church is now ready to see the lost and broken come into its church. Right now, if you need healing, you need God to change you, if you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you just have a need and you have a hidden pain, you want to just bring it to God. And you have a potential, but you're tired of living same old, same old. Right now, and I know there's going to be many, because this is an honest crew and a hungry crew. God is not looking for your performance. Every time I check my spiritual performance pulse, I always come up short. Do you? I never pray enough to you. I never get it all down. But I'm going to tell you one thing. Listen to me. I'm 75, and I've never been hungrier for God in my life than I am right now. I'm so desperately hungry for God. Are you? Why not? Our children are crying in the streets. Right now, I want you, and we're going to fill up this place. Suzanne and I would like to pray with, with you. Whether it's physical, whatever the need is, those three. I have a need, I have a hidden pain, and I have a potential that I want God to crack me open and fill me with his prayer. Step out right now. Come. Come from all over. Come. Quick. 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 Quick.